Hey, Richard Matthews of Matthews Wealth Management. Uh, we're going to talk about investing statistics today. It's the most thrilling thing in the world to, to talk about, I know, but uh, it is actually incredibly important to understand how to decipher statistics. And most importantly, what do they mean? How, what can they tell us about uh, portfolio performance? How can they allow us to compare certain portfolios to benchmarks as well as to each other? So. They are incredibly important. I promise I'm gonna make it understandable, okay? So first things first, we gotta do a refresher. Uh, if you go back to middle school or anytime you took statistics in high school, maybe college or whatever, we all remember the bell curve, right? So the idea of grading on the curve was that the average of the class would make a C, and then you'd have the Bs and the Ds, and then the Fs and the As, right? So uh, the, the core concepts of what we're going to be tracking in portfolios is going to be the mean or what a lot of people will just call the average rate of return and in our example just like most of my examples i'm going to use 7.2 percent so 7.2 percent is is the number that doubles uh the the overall portfolio value in 10 years so that's why i use that in this case we're also going to be mentioning standard deviation very nerdy word obviously but uh, what it means is that a certain sample size will generate 67% of its overall uh, performance figures in within the one standard deviation mark. So in this example, our standard deviation is 10%, right? So if our average is 7.2 and we have a good year, we'll look to make about 17.2. If we have a bad year, maybe a negative 2.8. But 67% of the time, we're going to fall somewhere in between those, right? So we have a mean and then a standard deviation. Just think of it as plus or minus, right? So we can go out to two standard deviations. And when we do that, now we're talking 97% of, uh, of our actual performance figures will fall within two standard deviations. Three goes out to 99.7, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the key thing that we're going to focus on is what is our mean? What is our average rate of return? And then what is our standard deviation? So this is kind of a middle of the road type bell curve. So we're gonna come back, we're gonna compare it to two other types of bell curves and try to uh, figure out what that could mean in terms of portfolio performance. So we're gonna be right back. All right guys, we're back. We got a couple more graphs up here to go over as far as uh, the statistics of investing. Uh, the first thing that I want to cover is actually this one on the left. Uh, this is a very different looking curve from what we talked about last time. However, if you notice, we still have that magical 7.2% mean, right? As far as our average rate of return, it's still going to have the same average. The thing that we've done differently is we've expanded our standard deviation from uh, a plus or minus of 10 to a plus or minus of 20, right? So this makes a tremendous difference when we're looking at what the shape of the curve looks like, it also adds a lot of question marks. When we're looking at the 67% of the time of where our portfolio is going to have its return, it's gonna be now between 12.8 on the losing end all the way up to a positive 27.2. So if we go two standard deviations out, you add another 20% to it, this is all over the place. It could lose 40%, where it could gain 40%, but it's gonna average seven in the long run, according to the statistics that we're operating under. By contrast, let's look at this other one, um, much, much narrower when we're talking about the standard deviation here. So exact same 7.2% mean, but instead of our 10 standard deviation on our standardized model, now we've got five, right? So instead of you know a, a plus or minus of 10, it's a plus or minus or five, so much much narrower window as far as having um, the majority of our holdings or our portfolio uh, returns falling within a certain um, percentage mark. So uh, the 67% will fall somewhere between a positive 2.2 and a positive 12.2. And uh, if we go out to the 97% likelihood, you know, it's showing a bad year is a negative 2.8, a good year is a positive 17.2. So out of all of these combined, this one with the least standard deviation and the same mean just means we're a lot more certain about what our rate of return is going to be. So really, if we can shrink the standard deviation with our targeted mean, we're gonna have a much uh, more pleasant experience 
with the roller coasters of the market when it goes up and down. So um, that's the whole concept here between just looking at these two pieces of statistical information. Uh, I want to come back and do one final segment where we're going to talk about some secondary level statistics. And this really gives us the way that we can compare portfolios to each other as well as to a benchmark. So we're going to wipe the board down and come right back. All right, last thing that we're going to cover here is going to be some secondary level statistics. Um, specifically, we're talking about beta, alpha, R squared, um, but they're all derived from the mean and the standard deviation. So what I've got here is an actual client account uh, where we're going to be tracking the, uh, the standard deviation compared to a benchmark. So this is a very important report that we review with our clients on a quarterly basis uh, to make sure that we're tracking these statistics. So if you were to ask my clients, and I know a lot of them are listening right now, but uh, if you were to ask them, I would say more than 80% of them actually can go through and, and look for the important stuff on their reports and, and tell you what matters, whether it comes from standard deviation mean, et cetera. So, um, not that they're all engineers by trade or anything, but this is a very important thing to communicate and it really gives us a good apples to apples comparison when we're talking about performance in excess or behind a benchmark. So the first thing that I want to cover on this portfolio here is let's just talk about that standard deviation. So uh, we have a standard deviation, which you remember is the plus or minus on each side of the mean. Um, and if we're looking at it from the side of the portfolio, in this example, we have a standard deviation on the portfolio of an 8.60. And the benchmark that we are going to compare against has a standard deviation of 9.96. So you can't really tell anything yet. We're just looking at the variance or the volatility of these two portfolios in comparison of each other. Um, but the means are very different. So the average rate of return or the mean, and these, these numbers are over a three year time period. Uh, under the portfolio, the mean is a 6.14% and the benchmark is a 1.73. So that is already incredibly different. Um, even if we have a kind of similar standard deviation, uh, we have incredibly different returns. So if you want to think of standard deviation and how to, how to put it in comparison in terms of risk, that's really what we're trying to describe. So there's a metric for that that we look at. It's called beta. So beta means that we're going to take the standard deviation of our portfolio. Standard deviation. And we're going to divide that by our benchmark standard deviation. So what we're going to do is this 8.60 and we're going to divide it by our 9.96. And what that gives us is what we call beta. And in this example, it is 0 0.81. So the significance of a beta is really going to look at what is the relationship of the portfolios plus or minus or volatility in relationship to a benchmarks plus or minus or volatility. So when we're looking for a beta, the main reason we would look for it is to verify that we have a relevant benchmark. If we're comparing a, an all stock portfolio to the 10 year treasury, that's ridiculous. That's apples and oranges and our beta would be just horrendous. In fact, that, that might be like four. Um, so really what our goal is when we're looking at these reports is to establish a proper benchmark uh, that has the right amount of volatility to compare. So it is an apples to apples comparison. So anything between 0 0.80 and 1.20 is the threshold of what we would consider a relevant benchmark. So we're a little on the low side of this. And specifically, this benchmark is the Dow Jones moderate total return. So think of it as kind of a 50-50 stock bond mix. Um, so this is within our tolerance of an acceptable benchmark, a little on the lower end of it. So really maybe more towards the conservative is what we would expect to have a, a, a better, but obviously we're going to get to the mean here in a little bit. 
But um, let's talk about the next secondary statistic that's important. This is what we call alpha. So what alpha means, and you may have heard this in seminars or uh, some, some news shows, CNBC, um, a lot of the different um, uh, radio, they, they might mention seeking alpha or chasing alpha. A lot of mutual funds have alpha put in it. Alpha is a statistic and basically what it means is um, efficiency above a benchmark. So if a benchmark is gonna make 5% in a year, you know, and this portfolio always makes 1% more than that, then it would make six that year. Or if the benchmark loses 10%, this would lose only 9%. That's another alpha of one that we're looking at. So what is the excess return above and beyond the normal efficiency of benchmark? That's kind of blah, blah, blah stuff. But this is the ultimate, uh, most important statistic that we review in these, uh, these actual reports because what it does is it normalizes our beta and says if our portfolio was at this amount of volatility, what would we expect as a rate of return and is that greater than or less than the benchmark? So in this example, our alpha comes out to a four 0.21, which is really, really good. Um, if you want to think of the absolute uh, easiest way to think of alpha, this is your investment advisor's or manager's report card, right? So if this comes out with a negative one or a negative five, I've seen some negative eights, that means that the way that they're managing your money in relationship to you just buying an index or a, or a Fidelity 2040 fund or one of those target date funds, if it's negative, their management is inefficient and costing you that percentage every single year. If you, if you can get somebody to run a uh, portfolio snapshot and establish a negative alpha, it's time to go shopping. Um, on the flip side of it, when you have a positive alpha, this means that this is an excess return and they're basic, that's basically what your investment manager is worth to you year over year over year. So I don't want to sell to clients that I'm worth 4% a year. My clients don't pay me that much, but uh, you know, I do a lot on top of investment uh, management in terms of tax planning, uh, estate planning, uh, looking at retirement projections, college tuition, et cetera. But uh, it's important to have a positive alpha with a relevant beta. So I know that these, these terms can get a little bit confusing. So if you need to watch this video again, uh, definitely do it because these are the ways that we compare portfolios to each other and to relevant benchmarks. So we can do some, some deeper dives on this and, and how to actually come up with these numbers and, uh, and look at the asset allocation, how it derives the different betas and alphas, but uh, we'll save that for a different video. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.